Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. Hello. Fred, that analysis of S bombs and build packs is awesome. I was just reading that. Thank you. If we get time, would you be interested to talk a little bit about that? Give a rundown to the team and just share a link of the write up. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Let me copy the link as well so that people know where to find it. Awesome. Aran is facilitating the meeting for us today. Yeah, hi. Everybody. Hope everyone is doing well. Well, I see a very thin agenda today. Um, but before we get started, um, do we have any updates on the working groups, please? Nothing new on supply chain since last week. We're still working on uh, editorial review of the paper. Okay, cool. Um, do you need any help there? Not currently. It's uh, pending on the CNCF tech writing team. We haven't heard back yet. Uh, we've been asking them for regular updates, but nothing as of yet. Hopefully we get something soon. Okay, cool. Um, I can give update on the serverless working group. Um, the paper um, is still being worked on. Uh, over the holidays, Ariel Schuper took uh, a stab on several subsections and he's added content. We're trying to schedule a meeting with uh, both, sorry, both US participants as well as APAC. Um, but let's see, um, that, that becomes challenging, especially for the West Coast people. Uh, so we're gonna try to figure out a time when we can all meet and decide the state of the paper. Um, I wanna encourage you all to take a look at the serverless white paper and put your comments. Um, at least give it a read through so we know how you feel about this paper. I, I mean, we can write a book on serverless, right? But it, it, does the content actually help people who are trying to do microservices, right? Um, that's the input we need from the wider teams, uh, especially John and uh, Pushkar, if you can give it a read through, that'll be helpful as well, because you were, you had some bandwidth to support this. So. Perfect, um, thank you. Um, John, do you wanna give an update on security controls? I know we chatted yesterday, but uh, for the group, right? John, you there, Zola? You're on mute now, it seems. Yeah, is that better? Yes, much better. Sorry about that, yeah. Um, yeah, so no substantial changes uh, for the past week. We are still working on wrapping up uh, kind of the current phase of where we're at. And we are uh, also uh, involved in some discussions for a potential future collaboration uh, with CSA. And uh, we'll see what that means in the following couple of weeks. Thank you, John. Um, so um, I think we had shared with the wider group as well. Uh, we had some conversations with CSA. They want to collaborate with us on a number of initiatives. Uh, we met with them in December, um, but we have a meeting later this week um, to discuss specifics. Obviously, we need some legal agreements in place, like memorandum of understanding, how the collaboration will work, how the branding will work, et cetera, et cetera. So those details are being ironed out. Once that is ironed out, we'll get... Um, access to all the volunteers that CSA has, and we can do some projects which make sense to collaborate with them. Um, not all projects, obviously, um, but we've identified a couple of projects. Um, uh, one of the projects um, is the security controls, right? They have a big CCM community. Um, um, and um, that community, um, maps all the controls to NIST 853, right, for cloud. And now they want to do it for cloud native. And we were doing something similar. So that, that makes perfect sense there. And then um, we can look at potentially other projects where we can collaborate with them as well and you know bring more value. Cool, do we have Robert? I don't think we have him, but um, policy- Hi, yeah, I'm down there. Oh, your number shows up. Okay, Robert, can you give us an update on the policy working group? 
I know we I missed the meeting this morning. If you can provide update, that'd be great. Yeah, um, we did have our every other week meeting uh, again. We hadn't had a call since early December, so uh, good to see everyone back together. Uh, we we have last year we finished our white paper. I think uh, we were looking for some help on the formatting of the white paper to kind of bring it in line with some of the other white papers. But, I mean, it's fairly vanilla kind of uh, markdown content at this point. So if if anybody has had any uh, graphic art <laughs> capabilities, putting these white papers into a better looking format. We, we... So Andres, maybe you have some guidance on that, right? What did we use for our uh, cloud native security white paper um, for formatting and technical? Yeah, items? we submitted to the CNCF tech docs team. I know they're a little bit backed up and have a number of things in their backlog but you do so by opening a ticket on the CNCF service desk. I don't know if you'd have access to that, Robert. Uh, you might. Uh, uh, no, actually, yeah, they, that came up today that there's a Jira service desk. I, I don't know how you get access to that, but I'm happy to go through that process. I think access is controlled by the maintainers.cncf.io list. So you need to be uh, named as a working group leader on that spreadsheet or that GitHub markdown where it ends up or be a maintainer of a project. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, um, I will, I, I think we have a ticket. I think Jim uh, did create a ticket, but I'll, I'll confirm with him and, and that sounds like the right process. Um, the content, the content is there for anyone to read. Um, I'm, I'm dialed in, so I can't post the link, but I think it's been posted before. Um, so we're, we're, you know, happy to receive feedback. And if anyone is actually using it, we'd love to get kind of case studies of, of people applying the, the recommendations. And of course, at some point we'll be plotting out version two. Next on, on the policy work group, we're, we're looking to complement the Kubernetes CRD for policy results of policy reports with more of a policy parameterization and specification. So that could overlap or, or complement the controls work. I think this would be more of a specification for control selection and the parameters for those controls. In, in the OSCAL, which is a standardization effort for more for, uh, from NIST, the OSCAL vocabulary, there's a concept of a profile model. So today's discussion was how that aligns um, with that policy specification discussion. So that, that will probably occupy the next several uh, worker meetings. So any, any and all are invited to attend every other uh, Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific. Thank you, Robert. Uh, definitely, I'll start attending those meetings uh, from next time. Yeah, what, one afterthought on, on Doc's cleanup is we're bottleneck right now on on the capacity of the tech docs team. I did ask earlier the team lead to see if they could provide us with the template they use. And for us to at least do like, and then it like populate the template and print it to a PDF. Maybe they can add some, some publish, but I know we want, we want to circulate like drafts and PDF format and collect comments through templates, not to have like a madness of, of Google Doc templates. Um, I don't know that we want to circumvent like the CNCF editorial process altogether, but at least having a template uh, that we can do some of the initial like proofing work ourselves would, would help. Uh, certainly it's something folks would need to volunteer to to give it like a once over and make sure it's it's close to like the first editorial pass that we do ourselves. Uh, Cause yeah, I know a lot of us are like waiting still to, to hear back and there's like just idle time and toil and everything else as a result. So I'll see if, if I get a response. If not, maybe we look at coming up in our own template as well. If they don't provide us one and we can standardize on, on that new template. What do you all think? I think, yeah, standard templates help a lot. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we publish something, right? <laughs>
Justin Cormack, what do you think from a talk perspective? Um, not sure. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot either. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking. We're talking about. Uh, well, we have we have this pipeline of of content we've created, and uh, right now, most of the work is idle, waiting on on CNCF to pick it up and give it an editorial review and clean it up. Uh, we haven't heard back on most of the documents since early December last year. So thinking whether we should come up with like our own, like I can probably share my screen and show you what I need. So the work that the Tech Docs team performs, I'm not sharing my screen yet. Good thing I have too many tabs so people can't really tell what it was that I had open. So they they turn it into this nice book format. I presume this is like a combination of Illustrator and something else. But uh, maybe we could like automatically generate these to some degree. Uh, we don't want to circumvent like the publishing procedure and sign off. I you know like talk liaisons ultimately have to sign off before anything gets published. But if we're to accelerate like production time of at least like drafts for public comment in PDF format. I mean, I, I'm, I think that we'd be happy to sign off anything in any form that's useful for people. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm certainly, um, yeah, I'm certainly happy to sign things off in a form that's not absolutely kind of print perfect or whatever. So we could, we could definitely sign off, um, you know, a draft version that could then be published potentially i think that as a kind of you know we could sign off a say a markdown version i think without any trouble okay because we we end up going back to kind of the markdown version being the master afterwards usually anyway so right I, and I'm, I'm kind of i do think they're getting things out in i mean it could we could call it a preview or a discussion version or something if if we still want to have a a, a big launch of a of a glossy version but i mean i do think that yeah i'd be, certainly be happy to sign off a, a another version before that if it's to get it out yeah we we have like the glossy version has been more the has been more the the master than than the markdown mostly because of like markdown formatting and structure is not like really easy on the ice so we found like but 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 after for for updates it tends to the markdown version tends to kind of become the real version again later because it's because it gets all the edits so yeah know. you know that's interesting we we actually haven't seen uh many many updates and I don't know if that's that's a result of the perception of the master being the PDF, which has resulted with like the security map, like assembling a crew for like a second edition that like incorporates all, all the proposed edits that have emerged since. Yeah. I mean, it is nice if we can have a workflow that we can produce PDFs more easily ourselves, I think, but it is a burden as well. It is a burden for sure. Right now there's a lot of lag, right? We could be, I don't want to use the word like cranking out faster because I don't think we should like compromise quality in the sake of like just having a, a regular cadence of putting out content, but we could certainly shorten a lot of the back and forth between us and the tech docs team. If we had like, yeah, a template of, of our own. Yeah. I think it's worth talking to them and seeing if we can work out something that lets us move a little bit faster. Yeah. Whether that's them prioritizing it more, or maybe like 
increase in staffing if there's more demand for their services. Cool. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Andrews. Um, Robert, yeah, hopefully you'll get some help from Andrews and the tech docs okay. team, right? So um, any other working groups have any updates? No, I'm just lucky to be here. Fantastic, Mark. <laughs> Um, so um, before we get to the agenda, I wanted to share two things with you. Um, one thing is um, that there's an OSCAL, NIST OSCAL workshop on March 1st and 2nd. Uh, if anyone is interested, you should attend. I'm pasting the link here um, in the chat window um, because OSCAL is going, getting a lot of traction in the industry and um, especially in the cloud native space and our policy working group has already been working on integrating OSCAL in, with the policies right, and detection and compliance. But at the same time, um, there's another NIST workshop which is um, on 27th of January and that is about zero trust and a lot of focus on cloud native technologies and zero trust there. So if you're interested, you can join in on that as well. Um, so we have only one thing on agenda today, and that is the issue 843. Uh, and 843 is basically, uh, we had a discussion in December about rotating project leads um, because everybody was band, is bandwidth constrained. And then, you know, um, we need the projects to continue to move. And at the same time, we wanna make sure we get different perspectives into the projects, right? Um, so the issue was created by Brandon. Um, you can go and review the issue. Uh, process has been defined as well. Um, the issue is not approved yet, but it is in review. Um, process is defined as to how we will make decisions and how we will transition. Obviously we want some overlap between the existing leads and the new leads um, and the timing of the transition as well, right? When are you transitioning a project from one lead to another? Um, so if you have any thoughts or comments, please review the issue and, you know, mark up your comments on the issue. Anything else we want to talk about? I don't have anything else on the agenda, unfortunately. Yeah, as, as you're joining, uh, we're talking with Frederick about a an analysis he did of uh, build packs producing S bombs. Okay. I found it to be super ins insightful and we have Fred here. He seemed like willing to able to talk a little bit of, more about the work he did, what he found out. Fred, you up for that? Yeah, I, I have time for it. And um, I posted the, uh, the link in the, in the chat. And so if you want to read what I had to say in detail, it's, uh, it's on there. Uh, in short, uh, to really understand this, you have to understand what build packs is, and there's a lot of misconceptions around it. People think the result of the build pack project itself is the build pack, um, but you know, what what it actually is is uh, you can think of, of the build pack as a as a container image that has two entry points, it has a detect and a build phase. So you can layer these things uh, with is where when you run the pack tool, it'll run a set of, of these container images, it'll run these, these containers uh, and it'll check with the detect, is, is this image, is what's in this image supposed to apply to this, to the set of inputs? And if it's, if the answer is yes, and then it'll perform wherever the build is. So a very simple example is, I might have something that compiles going. I, I might say detect a go.mod and if go.mod is present, then run go build or go install and then take the output of that and then copy it into a well-known location so that future steps of the build of the build pack framework could then uh, continue on with whatever it needs to do. So they're composable in sense that you could create things like we're going to create a, a, a scanner or that'll check for certain types of errors or 
maybe you want to stick a license detector in there or uh, or other similar things. And what this allows you to do is to be able to give a single command. You can just write run pack. It pulls in all of the tool chains as necessary based upon the processes and based upon what your development team is is using or is built. And it runs on the same way it runs in your local environment. You can run it in the same way as uh, CI CD. So if you look at uh, use one example, if you look at, uh, at at Google with their Google with their G Cloud, uh, there's an alpha product which allows you to do uh, uh, build as a service. It, it uses this, this exact same thing in order to produce those type of, of artifacts. So the build pack are the individual images that you can layer on top. Now, one of the interesting things here is this actually produces a, a nice set of of entry points that can help with the overall supply chain provenance problem. The first one is that you can better better track your tooling, saying these are the images, these are the SBOMs for each of the of the build packs that I'm bringing in. There's an opportunity to collect all of that information and ensure that it's represented somewhere in the SBOM, in the final artifact SBOM that, that's there. Now, these are things that still need to possibly be built. They're not in there. They're, they're primarily calling out opportunities. The second one is the SBOM itself, or rather the build pack itself for any given language or for any given uh, thing that you're, that you're building can itself have its own set of, of uh, um, SBOM generators. So when you run, when you run Go uh, in, this, in the previous example, if the, if the person who made the Go compiler build pack opts in to create an SPDX or create a Cyclone DX or SIFT or some other format, then that gives the opportunity for, uh, for that information to be captured and then, uh, and then sent down. And ideally the best case scenario would that would be part of the, part of the build step. It wouldn't be like a, a separate layer, but rather the build would say, this is exactly what I used in order to build it. So that way you can capture compiling information uh, information on the standard library was anything modified. So best case scenario would be for the build pack image producers to provide uh, to provide a option to generate uh, an SBOM. There is also an opportunity for information to be captured between the layers. So in other words, when you run a, a build pack, you have an set of, of, of input states before the build pack runs. And you have a set of you have the state after the build pack runs, so it is also possible to to capture state between the build packs uh, if that is of uh, if if that is of interest. That way you can explicitly determine the effects that every build pack had on a given build, which could be very useful when you're trying to pair something up into uh, the say in Toto and you're trying to look at the process as opposed to just the, the final set of outputs. So. I cover all of this in. I got some messages afterwards uh, through Twitter that some of this work was already underway and that there is some PRs that will be released soon that document what is being done. So I'll do another analysis once, uh, once that is complete. Um, but in short, the, the build pack system itself and similar types of systems, it doesn't have to be build packs, could be some, some other similar type of systems. Um, you provide a, an easy way to have standardized tooling that allow us to, to make it easy for the developer. Because one of the problems we're gonna run into is that developers, it's extra work for the developers and the developers get limited, uh, get limited benefit directly from the SBOM. The people who get the most benefit from the SBOMs are gonna be InfoSec, CISOs and similar types of people who have to go find where is Log4j installed? Where is, uh, where are these Go applications installed or, or, uh, or similar types of processes. And so it ends up uh, being something that the developer itself doesn't experience that level of pain. And, but it's not a trivial thing right now to set up a full process that, that gives you high quality uh, outputs. So ideally, uh, build pack could be one of the things that makes it easy for a developer to have something that is as easy, as close to a turnkey solution as we can get, 
without sacrificing the developer's ability to uh, to engineer as as necessary. So, uh, in short, that's that's what the the article is, is about. Fantastic. Thank you, Frederick. Questions, comments. Hey guys, uh, really great to be back. I have a conflicting meeting I can never seem to get out of, but I'm working on it. It's underway here. Uh, hey, uh, Frederick, about the metadata that's that's in the paper, is there uh, thought about expanding the use beyond what you seem to be laying out there to cover things like uh, identifying which modules are processing data that needs to have specialized data protection or uh, you know, data that's higher priority than others, or data that needs to be uh, processed earlier as opposed to later, you know, other kinds of metadata that could be domain specific. Is, is that really more something that could be added to this, or are you really intentionally limiting this to the usual, you know, last updated kind of metadata? Okay, that's a great question. So, when I think of these type of systems, I try to separate them into two areas, and then I try to work out how we can bridge the two. So the when you run pack, the end result is a static is a static output, and that static output provides you with useful information. There are useful claims that you can use to make decisions on on what you want to do. It does not perform a dynamic, like as things change over time, it does not perform that dynamic uh, portion. And there has to be a point where your runtime system is able to, through, uh, through some, some means, and my preferred means for this is at the, at the moment, it may not be the right approach, so don't think it is like the sole way to do it. Uh, would be to have some form of cryptographic identity that defines what that running process is. That cryptographic identity can be informed on whether I want to even issue it, that identity can be informed by the output that comes out of PAC or the output that comes out of the build process. So uh, I might have something that says, I have these versions of these libraries installed. And then that means I can then start referencing them against uh, against CVE databases or VEX when VEX comes around. And then I can make a decision. Do I, based upon the, the needs of the system, based upon the claims, do I want to label this or do I want to have the system allowed by policy to perform action on something that is sensitive, whether it could be, P could be PHI, PII, uh, PCI DSS or whatever processes that you that you have there, and if it falls out of policy, then uh, you would use that information to uh, you would use the information that you gathered through the SBOM through matching that with the dy dynamically changing databases so vulnerabilities and and uh, and VEX statements in order to determine whether you need to raise a flag, like a, an audit flag, so that someone can go look at it, because you may not want to just bring the system down. Uh, there may be other there may be other high impacts that if you, if you just bring the system down that, uh, that, that, could, uh, that could cause harm to life or, or property. Or, some, or maybe you do want to bring it down and it gives you an enforce, the enforcement capability. But all these type of things are out of the context of the build, but the build needs to produce enough information so that downstream things can make decisions. So ho hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're up to writing more text for this, but if you try to use OSCAL, for example, or a tool like Atlassity that's built on it to, to do compliance monitoring for something like PHI, PII, you need to inherit that through the SBOM in order to know what to monitor. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused in this scenario. Um, are, are, you, are you talking about the, trying to track the actual PHI, like where it went, or are you looking at it from, from the build perspective? Is there something there that, I'm, that I might be missing? Yeah, from the build perspective, it's, 
you know, which modules are touching the data of interest? Because that's this this is a property of the build. So if you have a uh, you know a microservice that's being consumed and the microservice is known to be uh, what we'll just say consuming PII or PHI, for example. Uh, well, you have to trace it through the build to know well where are the endpoints to be monitored for compliance, for pen testing, you know, for lots of other in purposes for security and potentially privacy and other kinds of integrity checking as well. But the, the build needs to do that because uh, if you if you if you can't follow the metadata through that, I don't know where you're going to get that. So. In, in our kind of mock-ups of how we might try to use OSCAL, we're not getting any help from the build processes about where the PHI is. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem is, uh, you, you first please and then I'll, I'll join in. Oh, thanks, yeah. Um, because we, I just, Mark, because we've been uh, using these, these same tools ourselves. Um, so, you know, the components, and, and that's an overloaded term in the sense of it's OSCAL specific, but the components, regardless of how they're built, I, it can be mapped to, you know, a concept of operations and what capabilities are exposed by some individual component or, or collection of components. Yes, I agree. If the build output metadata could attest to or annotate, I provide some capability. Um, and if there's an ontology to that or a keyword to that that can, can help you map that, I think that would be an extra help. But I think there has to be some operator uh, knowledge base, if you will, on top of that. And we, we happen to use a graph database, but that maps all the components that provide a given capability, a set of capabilities provide a different service, and then all the data flows that those touch so that we can map those in, in, you know, in very specific detail for things like SSPs and whatnot. So I can tell you what components for what capabilities, for what services, touch these data stores that have these data labels and categorizations. But that's all kind of built as this kind of separate graph knowledge base on, on, by pulling all these little hints together. So one previous, that is one of the things we're wrestling with on the, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Robert, I agree with you 100%, but one prerequisite is your data has to be tagged and labeled, right? If you don't have the metadata, to make those uh, determinations and decisions, right. you won't be able to do it. I think an important distinction yeah. is at build time, you don't have any forbearance or like clairvoyance of like, how is this going to be set up? What data stores is it going to be wired up with? What data is it going to touch? Right? Right. It could be Bash, yes. right? You can use Bash for a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a good... This this also this ties into a really nice uh, to really nice area though because I think the the problem you described is an important one and it's one that needs to be solved. I don't think the SBOM is the right place to do that because like I as a vendor, uh, not that I am a vendor, but if I if I were a vendor, I could produce a piece of software that you as a consumer can consume, but I can make no guesses as to. Ooh, at the end of the day, I, I can make some predictions on what you might want to do with it, but I cannot predict with great accuracy how you will integrate it or what it'll end up touching at, at, at the very end, uh, except in very rare, highly constrained circumstances. So I think part of what, what you're describing here, that the gap is that there needs to be some form of an inventory. That inventory is that every time something comes up, we need to know what is it, what is it can be informed partially by the SBOM. We need to know in what context is it running? Like, is it part of an application that's performing a set of work? And what has it been authorized to connect to and what has been authorized to connect to it? And the graph database that was mentioned beforehand is a good example of this, because this is all dynamic live information that represents the inventory of a live system. And in this scenario, the software bill of materials provides you with a static list of what of what went into a component, but does not help you with the uh, with the, by itself. Or I should say is, is not doesn't not that it doesn't help you. It does help, but by itself is not enough to produce the dynamic live graph of your of your environment. 
uh, there are some scenarios where you could possibly get the bill system to get down to that granular level of institute if you have very high control over your infrastructure and your infrastructure is very monolithic. Uh, so you can have wide, high scalability, but it's very monolithic in this approach. Then you might be able to get to this, but eventually even that may end up scaling to a point where, uh, where the bill system, the static information there is not enough. So yeah. it really comes down to inventory, like live yeah. inventory. Yeah, we tend to late bind configuration a lot. And so um, at build time, you don't really know how things are going to be run. And because um, you you don't, you don't, you're not usually seeing the Kubernetes manifest it's going to be run with or the configuration of the system that might inject sidecars and things like that. So it's, we've actually made it quite difficult to do these things in the ecosystem right now, I think. And it's, it, it's definitely limits what you can do with an S bomb, for example. Yeah, and and that's and that's okay that it's limited. It's about understanding the constraints. So we know that S bomb works really well with static processes and claims of what went into those processes and, and builds. And we know that it doesn't that it can inform a an inventory, but by itself is not sufficient to keep it in to keep it a live inventory of, of what's running because things can be upgraded independently and you have no way to update the, the S-bomb and keep the S-bomb meaningful. But um, um, to, the, to that uh, point, Frederick, if we have very strong uh, policy framework in the CICD pipeline itself, we can enforce those policies um, that if a software comes from vendor X, you're not like Solovent, you're not gonna allow that to access your, your, you know, proud environment or something like that. So, absolutely. Like, how, how do you, like, I can make, how do you bind those policies if all you have is a static list of components? You don't even know, like, what subjects or what colors to apply that. Like, you have, you have a service calling and you would need the live graph to tell, hey, this identity is made up by, this set of things, right? But unless you properly identify things in production, you, you can't do enforce those policies. If you can't yeah, like services apart. Like if we were to look at log4j as a as an example, as a case study, if we had this infrastructure available, step one would be to find the vulnerable versions of log4j and put a put a rule that spans the infrastructure saying any attestation process where we're spinning up or maintaining a service that has an S bomb that has Log4j listed in it with that version or set of versions reports to the infrastructure where it is and, and what it is, and including the S bomb information or, or a link to the S bomb. And so at that point, it's like the, this information is present. It's part of your live system, but it's static information in your in your live in your live system. And at that point. The, the actual audit and enforcement capabilities does not come from the S bomb, but instead your policy system, policy like, yeah. yeah, your OPA or Kiverno or whatever it is you're using is able to consume <laughs> those S bombs and then is able to make decisions. Do I want to run this workload? Do I need to audit this workload because, uh, or basically do I need to admit an event that this thing is out of compliance, but we'll still allow it in because it, we still need the service running. This becomes very important, especially in healthcare settings where just evicting a service because it's vulnerable, you might end up uh, killing the software that's keeping somebody alive. So we have to be, we cannot simply say shut down the system simply because it detects a vulnerability, uh, but we do want to know about it. And that gives the ability for somebody to go and, and remediate it if you don't have an automatic remediation path. And of course, the third one is enforced. Like you might have a, a set of systems that you say, we detected log per came out. We're gonna set a deadline of two weeks to get all this stuff taken care of. So we'll keep auditing. And at the end of those two weeks, we'll, uh, we'll turn on the enforcement for anyone who has not applied for an exception for extra time. And then now you have your infrastructure enforcing the properties that you, and you have something that enforces your, your policy, 
that is informed by the by the static information in the in the SBOM. So that's what I was saying. Like there has to be something that bridges you from the static information that's able to consume that. And the policy engine is is one of the tools that uh, that has fantastic uh, uh, that has. Uh, 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 let me just rephrase it. It's it's a tool that they can make that like OPA and similar can make use of these type of things uh, over over time as they start to get built out. Hey Fred, yeah. one and that's some of the conceptual. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, shifting gears a little bit, like not everyone uses build packs. I'm sure it's, it's gaining traction and adoption, but what opportunities do you see to take some of the same benefits, like the virtues of build packs, onto other solutions? That, that's a good question. And I, I think the, the build pack itself, I think, can represent a reference architecture. And if somebody says, how do you do it? The build packs tend to be very well defined. So you have less chance of something being tightly coupled with some other internal process. And so I think the build pack represents a, a place where we could point that as say, if you want to see how to do it in a simple environment, here, here it is. But the reality of this is that not every system will fit into build packs or other teams have very deep um, have very deep quantities of work that they've put into their own CI CD systems. And the cost of retooling to a build pack is just not feasible for the value they get out of it. So I think part of it is to make it easy to we have we have to have eventually something that says this is what uh, if you're using this language these are the type of things you can do, the type of tools that you can put in place. And here's where you put it. And here is the way to output it to make sure that it's useful, uh, which could include things like best practices, could include things like here's, here's how you sign it. Here's how you send it to something like, like SigStore. So I think that there needs to be something there that eventually uh, people can pick, pick and choose the, the tools that they want. But having something that's high enough level that, that we're not dictating the exact tools and types, but at the same time is low, low level enough that we're, we're giving them solid information as to what things need to be in their CI CD system to make this happen, I think would be of great use. And of course, we could do a reference implementation if we, if we really want to, to take it down to that level. But just, just getting that top level thing saying, Here's, here's what this does. Here's where you inject it in. This is why you want to have a type to the build and not do it as a, um, as a scan of the image after the fact it's been built. Um, not saying that, that scanners don't have value. They have an immense amount of value. And one of the big values we'll get out of post-build uh, post scanners will be validating the SBOM. Like as a consumer, I want to sometimes audit certain systems at random. Uh, or audit a system that's that's acting up, um, that or that is suspicious to see what's uh, to see what's inside of it. And one of the checks I want to do is does this match the S bomb from the vendor? And if it doesn't, then I want to be able to ask questions to the vendors to uh, why am I getting discrepancies here? Uh, so there's still value there. But in short, in order to maximize the accuracy of the S bomb and increase the total accuracy to the consumer, then we, we should provide information uh, there. Because the alternative is that SBOMs, if, they don't, if they're not accurate, may actually mislead your, uh, your InfoSec teams into thinking that they're more secure than they, than they really are or cause them to waste time where they don't need to waste time. So say an, an organization's workflow is, building using Docker files, which I, I see as the, the most common, or certainly like the common denominator, the entry point, like where do they go from there? We're, we're, we're looking to, as to how we can uh, plumb SBOM information through a Docker build. Um, mm -hmm. So we're starting a, a bit of research on, on what would work there so that it can be um, we can take incoming S bombs from the from layers, uh, put put in stuff for the for the things you're adding, and output it 
Um, so we're we're looking to uh, to work on that. So just basically build a build a kind of pla parallel plumbing layer alongside the build, so you can plumb through that metadata. We, but oh. this is kind of stuff that we're just starting on. But you know, we, we definitely recognize that classic Docker build needs a way of handling this too. And we, if people are interested, please ping me, and because I'm we're, we're looking for people who are interested in helping us work on this. That sounds dope, actually. I mean, I mean, like Docker build still like foreseeably will remain to be the the most widely used build service. Yeah. By the way, um, build kit, which is I think what the newer Docker composers built on, is really fantastic for these types. Yeah, of, yeah. So, uh, so this yeah. this work it will all have doc, build kit is where we do all the work on Docker build now. All the other stuffs kind of is being removed. Uh, build kit, so build kit is where this would all happen. Yeah, because my, my understanding is a uh, build kit is effectively a, a directed acyclic graph of things that you want to build and, and run, and it basically runs them. So, I mean, technically, a uh, it, it has close alignment with the frame with the type of uh, of environment that um, that build packs themselves run. So that's what I was saying. Like it doesn't have to be build pack itself. Like it could be Docker files. It could be something else. Just something that helps provide some of that uh, some of that information. Justin, I just pasted a link in chat to what I believe to be the rep of build kit. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Something to keep an eye out for. Good. Thank you. Do we have anything else you want to bring up or discuss? I don't know if George is on the call or the custodian folks. I think we have everything finalized on the custodian uh, joint review doc. But if anybody else needs anything, uh, or if Emily is on the call and needs anything, happy to make any final tweaks. This is George. I think Emily's sick, um, but we have everything in the PR and I have an additional PR with the self-assessment, which is basically the uh, Google doc just turned into Markdown. And that is a separate PR though, not the same one. Uh, let me get the number if anyone's interested in that. So Robert, do you know who uh, can PR approve? Or okay. that is the number? Eight nineteen. We'll look at it. We'll look at it. Thank you. I toss it in chat. Fantastic. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, George. George, what else are you working on? <laughs> Just those, those, those two things, and that's it. Those are big things. That's quite a bit. Uh, after KubeCon or whatever we meet, though, I would like to sit down with some of you and put me to work in some some kind of capacity. I've just been slammed. So, have, we, um, have we recently gotten a, a cloud custodian update or have you guys gone through like the talk for like a year review? Are you planning that anytime soon? Uh, yeah, we did the yearly review. And as far as I can tell, we're on slate to be discussing incubation. Is that next week? It's coming up, I think. There's like 12 other projects, I think, in the queue, if I saw correctly. Yeah, I, I can go check them trackers. But yeah, dope. But if, if anyone is interested to learn about Cloud Custodian, the self-assessment is probably a really good read. Uh, well, I guess just point of order there. I guess now that once we get the PRs approved, um, I think the process is we're supposed to present uh, to this group the, the assessment results, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. I guess we should probably get that on the calendar for, for either next week or the week after, depending on uh, George's other conflicts. Yeah, I'm ready. I don't know. We're in the steps of interviewing the users. There's like that um, uh, Ricardo is interviewing them. I don't know. Does that go before or after we present to this group? I don't have the steps in front of me. It's not. I think there's a parallel processes. So it's oh, okay. So they're going either order. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yep, sorry. The lag on the phone is kind of throwing me off. Sorry. Justin, you were saying? 
I'm saying it can go in either order. It's not it's not strictly defined ordering. You're doing the due diligence on this one, I presume. No, I'm not. You're not. No. Okay. Cool. I'm doing um, in Toto, which is just fit, I'm just finishing wrapping up. Nice. That's what's up. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the PR a review. Um, I'm gonna look for completeness, but if there's any particular area you'd like me to draw my attention to, or certain type of feedback you're looking for, point it out in the issue. Uh, first thing that I want to check is is the threat model, and that threat modeling doc produced by Capital One looks really thorough. So that's awesome. Some more. Yeah, I found like folks find assessments super useful when you're trying to get a project deployed and adopted within a large organization. And InfoSec hasn't been playing paying attention to the cloud native space and it's it's new to them, but they find it very beneficial to come up to speed, educate themselves, like and develop a, a solid understanding so yeah i've seen these reused quite a bit so sure there's big dividends i'm sure it's felt like a lot of work and a hassle <laughs> so you know what it was awesome to have the repo with everybody's uh the prior project that went because some were really thorough and some were very short so we trying to figure it out where in the middle we would you know what would work best for us and I mean, it was just really great to be able to see, go back and see all the other projects before us. And then, you know, it was still hard work, but, <laughs> you know. For sure. Yeah, and the middle ground is, is the sweet spot, I think. So for, for the next project down the line, we'll tell them to look at Cloud Custodian, do the same. I'm hoping. It's a level. Sounds good, thank you. Um, so we did not talk about security assessments today. Um, John Kinsella, do you have any updates on that? Um, we are having another meeting with Argo tomorrow morning at, is this it? Yes, that's um, uh, 7 a.m. Pacific time. So we're moving on that. Uh, that's gonna be the end of the um, naive questions and we're gonna get in and, and try to move on that since we've been sort of slow over the holidays, but that's the status of that one. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to share with everyone the CFP for Cloud Native Con EU is out. So if you have any good ideas to present, please feel free to submit your ideas and we'll get it into the mix for evaluation of the conference content. Anybody has anything, any comment, questions, concerns? Hey, just a Providence question. Who was it brought up the ontology when we were talking about metadata? I want to follow up with that. Uh, that was me, Robert, Robert Ficalia. Okay, I'll look for you somewhere or, you're not on the chat, right? Uh, no, no. I'm, I, I'll be back on Slack uh, in the next couple of hours. So either the CNCF Slack or the Kubernetes Slack. Or the okay. okay, good. Don't want to follow up with that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to help. Okay. Hey, but uh, if there's anyone new to the group that would like to introduce themselves and share their interests, what's brought them here and what they want to take out from. Anyone new? Doesn't sound like that. Any, any regulars with any other updates, something they've been working on they want to share? Rory, Marina, Michael. Nope, nothing from my end. Yeah, I don't have any updates. No updates. Thomas Underhill. 
Hi, it's Rory here. One, the only thing I might mention is the um, the work we did on uh, an admission controller threat model uh, under Kubernetes SIG security is just about complete now. So there should be a blog post coming out next week. Uh, and I can probably find a link if anyone wants to read the threat model log. That would be great. Um, I would like to see that threat model thing. Let me go. Appreciate it. I was looking at a little bit ago if you want me to post it, Rory. Uh, yeah. It, looks, actually, it actually looks really good. Yeah, actually, oh, here we go. I found it. I should have it. I just got it. Hold on. Let me in the chat. There you go. I'll put a link in the chat. And then the, the, there'll be a blog post coming out, uh, which will get published, I think, in a week's time. Sounds great. Michael, do you want to share any updates on the financial services working group? Oh, sure. Um, so yeah, I uh, just as um, so we we canceled this this uh, past week's meeting just because of um, uh, there there were some folks out because I guess they've caught COVID or and other folks were kind of um, uh, caught up because they were covering for folks who 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 either caught the flu or COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, so from the financial services user group, we're, we're definitely looking for um, additional collaboration points with uh, the security tag and security tag projects, uh, as well as looking for demos um, as well. I know uh, the security controls, um, we're very interested in uh, seeing, you know, a, a demo or presentation as well as, um, as, well as uh, collaborating with uh, the uh, security controls working group. Okay, cool. Very good. Uh, we'll invite um, you, Michael, um, uh, to our follow-up meetings. John, let's make a note of that. We are setting up a collaborative meeting with CSA, uh, CCM group, and um, the security controls working group. And we'll invite um, your folks, Michael. I'll, I'll send the invite to you, and if you want to forward to yep. the group, that'll be great. Or I can post it in the Slack channel, and. That way people can get engaged when we get started on those initiatives. Awesome. Sounds good. Fantastic. Any last thoughts, anyone? I was just asking Rory and chat if he plans to present this anywhere, the threat model for mesh controllers. Yeah, definitely keep an eye out for that. I think it'd be, um, it'd be worth kind of like talking through the process a bit, uh, hopefully, hopefully with some interest. What methodology that do you all follow? Um, so essentially, it was fairly loose, uh, and what we, we it was kind of an iterative process of looking through, uh, of talking to people in the space, who you know, um, things like the Kyvernel project, and just going through how you would attack it, how you would use it, uh, and then the only potentially interesting thing was using Deciduous um, to actually create the kind of graphical element of it. Um, Deciduous, if you haven't seen it, is a kind of YAML um, a kind of threat model generator. Um, and I actually uh, have an online version of it, but I, I wrote a little Rails app because because Deciduous doesn't let you share threat models. It's just like a one-page HTML app. So I um, I, I'll put this in here. Uh, I created a little kind of Rails app that, so you can store and retrieve them. Uh, but apart from that, nothing too heavy. Okay, super cool. Yeah, if if you'd be interested to talk more about like process and like working through the threat model, I think this would be a great venue for it whenever we have time some other Wednesday. Uh, yeah, nothing super formal in the results. People can read the, the threat model, go read the blog. But yeah, yeah, dope. Cool. Well, we are out of time. Thank you all for coming today. Great discussion. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yes.
I'm escaping from PI planning. It's coming. We'll be on TikTok. Oh man, that's funny. It was good seeing you today. I'll catch you later. Great. Cheers. <laughs>